How's yeah. everything? Yeah, it's great to have you here. Seriously, welcome to our channel, Techno Savior. Hi, Rob. Welcome Thank you. to our channel. Yeah, and we are really, seriously, we are really, really excited to have you uh, for interview in today's channel because we know that today is the big day for Zen Cash. Uh, probably today the Super Node has been launched. Am I right? Yes, and everything went yeah. perfect. So, <laughs> yeah. So today you might be in the party mode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be a party night. <laughs> it's still too early in the U.S. to party. Still oh. a little too early. But yeah, we'll wait till tonight. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> Okay, so uh, first of all, would you like to introduce yourself to our viewers? Like, uh, we definitely know a lot about you, but uh, our viewers would love to know you more. Yeah, of course, for sure. So I, I'm Rob Viglioni. I'm a co-founder of Zen Cash, uh, president of the uh, Zen. We have the nonprofit entity supporting the the uh, project. Uh, my background: I'm a scientist by background, physics, mathematics, and then I I combine that with my PhD in financial economics. So. I, I think this is important for where we come as a project is we want to be strong in the technology, but also make sure that we're strong on the economics. Um, because I think the economics is how you really design systems that are sustainable in the long term. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Yeah, Rob. So I would like to ask you, like, uh, recently you might be knowing, I mean, all of us know that uh, Zencash was attacked, was having the 51% attack. And uh, yeah, I think because of this, most of the investors might have, uh, the confidence might have gone down. So I would like to know that how you dealt with it and what all steps you took. And uh, if in future the same scenario comes up, then what are you going to do once again for that? Yeah, so I think the initial reaction was people panicked and they said, this is one of the worst things that can happen to a blockchain, right? Uh, but then when they, they kind of stopped and looked at what we did and how we handled it, uh, I think the confidence very quickly came back. And some of our biggest institutional investors, um, you know, like Barry Silbert and DCG, for instance, they saw how we responded and how the team came together. And they said, wow, this is actually professional the way they handled it. So they actually had more confidence in us after uh, than before just because of the way we, we, we dealt with everything. So what we did was actually a few weeks before the attack, there was a, a blog post that came out that kind of highlighted how easy it was to do these attacks. I don't know if you guys remember that. It said it kind of ranked projects by, you know, Bitcoin costs half a million dollars to attack. You know, Zcash costs this much, Zencash costs this much. And then we saw this and we said, okay, well, we have to do something. So it's not like we, we you know, we're doing nothing. What we did initially was, we had a plan and the plan started with, we need to monitor our network and set up like a tripwire system. So if something looks like it's happening, we can catch it immediately. Um, and that's exactly what happened actually. So as soon as the attack happened to us, we, we found it, we caught it and we, we had a team, like an operational team that can't, you know, spun up at like 1 a.m. in the morning and worked all morning from like 1 a.m. till 6 a.m. Um, actually working on this attack. So the, the team consisted of our technical team uh, our operations team, our marketing and PR team, so that everyone was working together so that we were able to communicate with all of the exchange partners we have and all of the big mining pool partners. And we were able to help put in like uh, mitigation plans immediately. So the first thing you can do in this type of incident is to have all of the exchanges increase their minimum confirmation time before they release deposits. Like that's that's the, the most important thing you can do immediately. And that's what we did. Um, so the, the first thing you could do with the 51% attack mitigation is to have all of your exchange partners increase the minimum confirmation times. And that stops the attack uh, immediately because it just becomes so much more difficult to for a hijacker to hijack a, lar a large sequence of blocks. Um, so, but that's not enough. So what we've been doing actually in the last month is we have been doing a revision to the, the Nakamoto consensus, this longest chain rule that adds a penalty metric to delayed reporting of blocks. And this is really the big problem is a 51% attack essentially is some, some hacker is privately mining a sequence of blocks that has a double spend in it. And then they inject all of these blocks simultaneously into the chain. Uh, this is the problem we have to stop. So it, it's not that it's not like um, a crazy science project to stop it. You just penalize the delayed reporting of blocks. So that's what we're doing, which we think is going to be able to um, help the entire industry overcome this 51% attack threat. And then we have a third thing that we're gonna do on top of that, which is a, a notarization scheme similar to what Komodo does, but we use our own nodes 
So essentially at defined block intervals, say like every you know, 10, 20, 100 blocks, we notarize the chain to say this is valid truth and you can't revise that. So that's, that's the, the third layer that we're gonna add on to it. So I think in total, there's, this will solve a lot of the problems for the industry. Yeah, it's great to know like you have planned out everything. So my question here over is like, uh, if you can plan this right now, why didn't you plan it earlier? I know it's a dis uh, distributed system and it's difficult to provide any improvements easily. But since yeah. you're doing it right now, where you have been uh, already a good uh, coin and uh, your user base has increased a lot. So why didn't you mm -hmm. plan it earlier when the user base was small? Mm -hmm. And it was a known attack. It's not uh, yeah. something out of the box. So th this is, uh, it, it's a very fair question that we get quite a bit, obviously. Uh, so I mean, the, the reality is this is as an entire industry uh, for the last 10 years, we've known about this protect, you know, 51% attack threat. No one's really taken it seriously. We've always assumed, like the initial assumption for, for Bitcoin even was um, the economic incentives don't justify the cost in launching this kind of attack because it's a stochastic event, like a stochastic attack, meaning that it's probabilistic. So you can go, if you're a hacker, you can go and invest half a million dollars and roll the dice to basically try to steal money from an exchange with a double spend. That's what a 51% attack is. It's not a guaranteed thing. So I think as an industry, we've entirely taken this too lightly. But what I can say is uh, the reason we did is because the economics didn't make sense up until maybe a year ago or six months ago. And we're just now starting to realize that the economics have changed of the industry. So number one, the hash rate is much cheaper now than it was 10 years ago, right? Bitcoin, when Bitcoin launched, Bitcoin could have been 51% attack for the first few years for you know a trivial amount of money. Uh, but no one took it seriously because it just didn't make sense. The economics weren't there because Bitcoin wasn't, number one, it wasn't valuable enough to do. And number two, it was, it was too obscure. Like no one really cared. Um, now we have ha a quarter trillion dollars in this industry. So now all of a sudden it's a very economically viable um, thing to do to try to attack. And at the same time, so we've had increase in value and decrease in cost of doing the attack. So I think the economics have changed. And the reality is it's only been a recent change. This hasn't been the case for a long period of time. So, you know, us as a project, we found out like, you know, a few weeks before this actually happened to us, like, wow, we can't believe the economics have changed so much. We have to do something. So we started to do something, but software development in a distributed system that's global, it takes months, honestly, to do like a, a serious, you know, software development lifecycle change. Um, and that's what we've been doing. So as soon as we realized this was a threat, we right away started like doing mitigation plans with like uh, monitoring uh, mitigation actions with exchange partners and then software development. So right now we're nearing the, the completion of a software development cycle on our code is going to our test net. Hopefully next week is our target. Uh, so you'll be able to see what the code is and we'll be, we'll be able to try to break it collectively. You know, our community <laughs> will, will be on test net. We'll try to do everything we can to break it and show that it doesn't work. And then if it survives that, then we push it to mainnet. So, but this is the way software works, especially for distributed systems. You can't, you know, change software. So we have something like twenty thousand, or no, I'm sorry, like uh, you know, fifteen thousand uh, nodes running around the world right now between secure nodes, super nodes, and then other nodes that aren't even counted because they're just not participating in the program. And how do you convince fifteen thousand plus people to just all update their software simultaneously? It doesn't happen overnight. You have to plan the stuff. You have to do it methodically. So that's where we are. You know, it's a fair question, but the, at the same time, the, the industry is different today than it was even a year ago. Yeah, this answer makes a lot more sense because uh, we all have been wondering, like, if this can be done now, why it could not have been done in past? So yeah, there, yeah, there yeah. is a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, it could. And even today, I, I'm not convinced that even today it's all that economically viable because so, you know, the, there's a misnomer when people said, uh, you know, it costs like $30,000 to hack Zen or do this 51% attack. That's not that's not true because they have to first go buy half a million dollars worth of Zen, right? And then try to do this. And then yeah. there's a risk, you know, if they cause panic in the network by doing this before they sell their Zen, they lose the value on their investment, right? So there, there's, it's a very complicated thing. It's not so easy, black and white to say that it's so profitable to do. Yeah, basically two things are involved, I think. Like one, first of all, you need to buy hash power, which will cost millions of yeah. dollars. And second, yeah. you need to have that much worth of coins to do, do that. 
Scale of attacks. <laughs> exactly. It, and it's dangerous because you have to have this much value in coins, but you're doing something that's going to hurt the value of those coins. Exactly. So the economic compatibility here is very, it's a very like tight rope to walk for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the way you overcome these all situations, that was really impressive. And uh, probably this is the reason like we are still bids in cash. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I can say the team did a phenomenal job. And even like our, our PR and marketing team, they were up all night with our, our development team and they were documenting everything. So that the very next morning, we're able to release a very coherent, you know, um, full story to our community so that they understood exactly what happened and what we're doing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, Rob, here I would ask, like to ask a question: like, uh, when are you planning to go like ASIC uh, resistant? And uh, <laughs> yeah, and if you are planning, then what do you think you uh, the GPU miners uh, uh, would gain the profit by? Yeah. Like, so this, this is hard questions for yeah. us. Seriously. Yeah, you know, you're doing all the hard questions, but I love it because these are <laughs> these are the best questions. So in economics, we have something called real options, mm -hmm. and in economics. Uh, the value of a real option is higher before you exercise it, meaning that if you if you keep your options out there before just choosing a particular path, you have much greater value to your system. So that's just like a preamble to say uh, we are evaluating all of our options. And of course, one of the easiest options is um, an Equihash parameter shift to 1445, um, which is probably the most likely thing that we would do to kind of signal support for the ASIC resistance. Because just philosophically, we, we believe in decentralization and we don't want concentration of hash power. Um, now, let's caveat this by saying ASICs themselves are not a problem. There's nothing wrong with ASICs. ASICs are just more efficient machines um, that are sent. It's just a more efficient GPU. So environmentally, they're better. Economically, they're better. The problem is when you have one manufacturer that dominates all of the ASIC distribution, right? That's the problem here. And we're already seeing competition in ASICs. So Right. If there will be cheap ASICs uh, available, like GPU at the cost of GPU, then definitely ASICs won't be a problem. Right, exactly. So, but at the same time, we, we want to signal support for our GPU mining community, um, and we want to also make sure that we're not having concentration by you know a few heavy manufacturers that dominate this industry. So, we are going to be exploring the four, the one four four five param shift. Um, now, in terms of sequence of events, you know, if you look at our roadmap, we have a very full roadmap. So the first and most important thing was, well, we need the 51% attack mitigation code done immediately, right? So that was the, the most important thing. So we started analyzing our ASIC options, ASIC resistance options, and then the 51% attack happened. So we said, okay, we have to shift everything to solving this problem right now. Now, once we're done with this, so probably after next week when we have our, our code in testnet, We'll probably shift some of our engineering resources now to seriously evaluating the the Equihash parameter shift. So, okay. So I would like to ask, like, uh, since super nodes have uh, gone live, like uh, it might be in testnet right now. So, what are your plans with that? Like, what are you planning to explore with the super nodes as of now? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it yeah, the connection uh, cut out a little bit. Could you repeat oh. that question? Okay. So, since super nodes have gone live, or uh, it will be in testnet as of now. So what are your plans as of now to do with those super nodes? Oh, yes. Uh, OK. So the the whole motivation for super nodes was, you know, we have all these secure nodes out there. And we track all of the secure nodes all the time. And we, we, we pay them um, you know, with linking to the tracking system via these server clusters that are off chain. So mm -hmm. what we don't want to do is have off chain servers that are monitoring the on chain stuff. So the whole point of super nodes was actually to migrate all of that tracking and payment logic onto the chain and automate it. So this was like, a, you know, we, we had a multi-phased plan for how we were going to do our nodes. Um, and, you know, this is the next phase of the plan where we want it all on chain. So actually, the main point of super nodes was to do the secure node tracking and payments. And then the second big thing was, well, we're pivoting into, a, you know, being a platform now. Like we're, we're migrating, we're going beyond being a cryptocurrency. And now we're building actually a side chaining solution with embedded voting an embedded voting system. So the voting system is actually going to be the next thing that we put on a side chain. Uh, so that would be a very exciting thing. And we we're looking to be a little bit ahead of schedule even on that work, which is very, very nice news. But we're targeting the end of the year having like a, an operational voting system where the resources that we have as a community will now be available to vote for members of the community. Um, which I think is a very important democratic institution that we're building here. 
Um, so this is like another big purpose of sidechains. And then the next big purpose is we want generalizable sidechains with smart contracting and a nice API, sort of like Ethereum. So, you, so app developers now can start building on top of our network. That's, yeah. that's the, the next big vision for sidechain. So you see the way we do things is we start simple and then we kind of do it the next step and then we do a really big step after that. Yeah. So smart contracts is going to come into Zencash looks like that. Yes, absolutely. If I have anything to do with it, that that will be <laughs> that will be the case. Yeah, <laughs> it's nice to hear. Yeah. So, and one more thing about this uh, secure node upgrades. Like, it seems like uh, it, there is a mandatory upgrade coming to secure nodes. So, is is it going to change the requirement of secure nodes? Like, uh, will it decrease from four GB RAM to two GB RAM, something like that? Um, so actually, um, the the hardware requirement for the you know or for RAM for sure will decrease because uh, with this upgrade on our software we have 1.7 um, gigs for um, shielded transaction computation. So to, can, to to do a snark computation now it's 1.7 gigs versus it was kind of three and a half to four gigs right before that um, or depending on your machine, but now that it, and the way that we enforce hardware requirements on our nodes is by challenging all of the node operators to do a snark computation. So if you can do a snark computation with 1.7 gigs, that's the new hardware requirement. Right? Okay. So that's, yeah, that's, that's the change that we have now. Yeah, this will be definitely be beneficial for secure node operators. And I remember last time we yeah. with uh, Rolf, I was planning to have a secure node. Uh, node. Now I actually do have a secure node. Nice. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I mean, okay, I'll tell you my vision for secure nodes is yeah. I want a secure node in every home and every family around the world. I want them to have a secure node, oh, right? Well. Uh, yeah. Because I want everyone to be able to earn income, and then I want I want the, the network to be truly distributed. So the big vision for me is I want this system to liberate people all over the world, economically even, right? I mean, we talk about secure um, data, secure transactions, but really, if you're not free economically, you're not really free. Right, and if people are struggling on what do you eat, do you have enough money for your home, for your family? I mean, th these are challenges that so many people around the world face that we need to try to solve. So what we're trying to do ultimately, I'll tell you the big vision for Zen, for me, is I want to build ultimately a huge distributed application ecosystem that, that uh, secures the data from all of these applications and the individual user owns their own data and could just monetize that data themselves. So right now, instead of Facebook owning all of your data and Facebook, the company, making money off of all of your own data, I think that every human being could own their own data and make money on their own data. So if you can give every human being a few hundred dollars a month or a few thousand dollars a month because they're able to rent or they're able to run nodes or even they make money by being good citizens of our ecosystem and voting, right? Like the whole goal here is to create a whole bunch of different income earning options for people so if they participate in this ecosystem, it's like a peer-to-peer -peer world without borders. We don't care what country you're from. We don't care what language you speak, what race you are, what color you are. You're a human being, and you have a right to participate. So this is the big vision. This is the big humanitarian uh, vision that I see for Zen and where I hope we're going. I, I think we're making some good progress. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. I like your view. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, so uh, probably uh, I think we had a schedule of half an hour only, so we had come up with this many questions. So probably you have some okay. plans after this. Yeah, we do. So I, I can uh, I can say we have some very interesting um, plans coming up in the pipeline. So the big things, if you look at where we're going this year for the rest of the year, so we have also um, a radical transparency mandate that we have with our community. We we want to show everyone in the world exactly what we're doing with our money. So we have a project right now that um, actually Gustavo from our user experience and product team is building. It's a portal where you'll be able to see probably in a month or so, um, kind of like a pie charts and graphs and everything with um, how we spend our money. Like what percentage goes to engineering, what percentage goes to marketing and so forth, what percentage goes to the team. Um, so everything will be very transparent. I think this is very important for like our democratization of, of this system where we want everyone to see exactly what's going on. There should be no, no secrecy. Um, then on the technical side, I think the side chains are gonna be a very important part of our ecosystem because the side chains are gonna give us um, ultimately smart contracting, distributed app development, and really the, the big benefits of what we want as a system is 
we don't just want to be a currency that people like buy and sell and trade and hold on to. We want to actually have useful applications that make people's lives better. Right? This is the ultimate goal of where this industry needs to go. And we haven't been doing a very good job yet as an industry. Like the apps are very like rudimentary, clunky, not very good user interface, not very good user experience. So th this is a big focus of where we're going for the, the rest of the year. But we also have some really interesting R&D that we're doing in the, the directed acyclic graph domain. So this whole DAG domain. Like, like um, we're trying to improve um, the DAG architecture that, say, IOTA has or these other transaction graphs. Um, so the, the way that IOTA and these other DAG systems work is they basically arrange all of their transactions into a tree structure so that you have a continuously expanding out kind of a you know, tree that they, they claim could be exponentially um, you know, scalable because transactions are themselves um, validating other transactions. But I think what we realize a little bit in, is that, uh, at least I'll tell you, I'm skeptical of these things really being uh, exponentially scalable because they have state stability problems. Like imagine a tree where you have thousands of tips, you know, growing per second. And like, how do you propagate this to a distributed global network in a way that's meaningful? And, you know, every node on that network can keep a good state stability snapshot of where, where you are as a, you know, a, as a system. So what we're doing is the R&D is we're looking at packaging transactions into blocks like we do currently. So it's still going to be proof of work optimized. But then the blocks themselves will be organized into a tree structure. So this will be much more tractable. So instead of thousands or potentially tens of thousands of tips to a tree or leaves to a tree, we're going to have maybe like one or two dozen per second. So it, it'll be much more stable, much more sustainable and scalable. So this is very exciting R&D. But we're still at the very early stages. We're still um, our, our researchers are looking at putting together or releasing a white paper, uh, hopefully this week or next week, where we'll show you um, where we are in the progress. But we started by anal like validating math proofs. And, and like academic protocol. And then we'll go from math proofs to prototyping, then from prototyping to production code. So it's, it's a long journey, but this is the way serious research and serious engineering is, is you can't expect major changes like every month, right? We're still doing stuff. We, we still have short-term stuff we're doing. We have a short-term you know, product release cycle. We have medium-term like software engineering. And then we have long-term projects on the R&D side that are equally as exciting, maybe more exciting, because they're so disruptive and so innovative, but they take longer. So people have to be a little patient. And in this industry, sometimes it's hard to get patience because mm -hmm. everyone wants things immediately. Like, what are you doing today to make the price higher? I, I mean, this is not the way you manage a project. So we're looking long term. We're, we, we want to be you know, the most useful chain, the most useful ecosystem three, five, or 10 years from now. OK, great. So that was a very nice overview of the future of Zencash. Yeah, literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we would like to end the interview here. But before ending, we would like to clarify, like we had a news that Zencash is going to have a new name. So probably can we get some hint of what the new name would be of the coin? Uh, <laughs> you heard about the rebranding, huh? Or <laughs> We call it a, a brand expansion because we're not rebranding entirely. We're just expanding from being a coin to being something so much more. So I, I can't tell you what the name is exactly, but I can tell you it, it's just an expansion. So we're not completely redoing everything. We have a very strong past, and we don't want to lose that. Um, but we're expanding it into being something that's so much more. OK. OK. Yeah. So no, it, was, it was really uh, nice to, to have a talk with you and uh, interview you. And uh, yeah, so our viewers are really going to get a lot many information from today's video. So yeah, so, so really, we thank you for, for coming to our channel and giving us this interview. Yeah, it thank is, you so much, guys. Been, yeah, this has been fun. And <laughs> yeah, and uh, lastly, we would like to congratulate you for today's launch, the Super Node launch. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. <laughs> the, the the team needs congratulating. So they they did all the hard work. So. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much, Rob. Thank you yeah. so much. See you. Right. Have a nice day. Right. Take care. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye.